This is Alex from All Things Dentistry. Thanks so much for joining me. We're having a, an amazing question and answer period with Dr. Ali Nassay from Real World Endo, and he's going to be answering some of our subscribers' comments. So here he is celebrating his birthday, and without further ado, Dr. Ali Nassay. Would you mind talking about some of the different schools of thought regarding the apical one-third preparation? Sure. So there are several schools of thought when it comes to apical preparation. The... Uh, Everybody agrees that ultimately what you want to have is you want to have the apical area of the tooth as clean as possible and disinfected as much as possible, right? So the question is, what is the best way to go about that? There has been a historical kind of uh, view of a certain apical diameter as a minimum possible. Then Dr. Schilder and his um, you know, disciples came and kind of said that we need to have a specific shape, and we'll talk about that one as well. And then ultimately, a little bit later on, people went the other path and said the apical preparation should be finished last and to a much larger degree of preparation. So there's like about three different uh, schools of thought, if not more, but let's just say two or three more common ones. Uh, so one thing is about apical preparation. The other thing is also about the length as to where the apex should end. So that's a whole separate argument, which we're not going to get to because, as you know, that could, that could be kind of controversial as well. But let me just quickly, just to share this with your viewers, to talk about this concept here, that what we're trying to do here is to, um, if let's say this is the tooth that we're dealing with, and this is the kind of apex that we have. Oh, let me just kind of make this a little bit smaller. And inside here, what we have is we have tissue. The the problem that we deal with is the same problem that most people uh, have been suffering from is generalizations. At the, end of the, uh, at the end of the day, essentially, for all medicine, people end up talking about generalizations, but generalizations are good in general. The reality of the matter is that every case is unique, and that goes to the ultimate goal of all medicine, which is personalized, customized, individualized medicine. The same thing goes through with dentistry. So when we talk about what is the apical preparation, the real answer, the philosophical answer is it depends. It depends what tooth you're talking about and what patient, what kind of anatomy. If you have a fairly calcified tooth, then by the time you create your uh, shape, if you will, you know, you're going to have essentially eliminated and removed additional dentin from all over uh, on the sides. However, if your original shape was a much wider canal, which was irregular, like this, I don't know if you guys can see this now, it's getting confusing with too many lines, is well, what, that looks good. We got what it. Yeah, so what, what happens is that you're going to end up undercleaning. And but by undercleaning, what I'm talking about here is that you're going to end up, um, let's say, creating a shape, but then having areas that are still not clean and have that harbor tissue. So you could have, uh, you know, some tissue in here still like that on the sides. And that could be a major problem for you if this tissue is infected or becomes necrotic, even if it's vital, and then it becomes necrotic. And then you have microbes in the area that could use the substrate to multiply. And then bacteria starts to work its way out. And now what you have is you have infection, even though you may have, in fact, filled the canal up. It's because you now have a sliver, if you will, a triangle right here of tissue that has been left behind. So the idea here is to make sure that your apical preparation is encompassing of this space as well. That is mechanical shaping. Right. This way, what you've done is you've also eliminated this and you have a shaping that encompasses that. That's those schools of thought that believe in larger apical diameters, because based on the histological studies that were done back in the 60s and the 70s, many people found that these look, the apical diameter of many of these teeth is like equivalent to a size 60 hand file. But we're not cleaning these to that size. We're cleaning. Many people are talking about, oh, just universally clean the thing to a size 25. So what ends up happening is if you have a diameter, let's say this is your root, this is your canal, right? 
and then you are taking a 25 diameter here, what you're leaving is you're leaving a whole rim of tissue on the walls, on the side of the walls. You've cleaned that out. So that's the essence of why you need chemo mechanical uh, cleaning and shaping. Okay, so that's the chemo part of it that comes in. That's where you do need to have a disinfectant that has tissue dissolution capability combined in order to be able to have adequate success rates. Otherwise, you're going to end up leaving a rim of tissue. And now what we know is that you leave tissue in cases where you have vital teeth. But what about cases where you have necrotic teeth? Now that's replaced with biofilm, which is even worse than tissue because tissue at least has a chance of being sterile and not cause a problem. But if you have biofilm, you already have bacteria that's very tenacious in there. And you can think of biofilm uh, ash as a as sludge. You know, if you think about like moss growing on a wall, right? That's like biofilm equivalent. It just doesn't go away if you just hose it down with a with a uh, with a with a water hose. You need to get in there and literally scrape it off the wall in order to get uh, to get rid of it. So that's why it is important to have a diameter that allows you to touch these areas and be able to clean them to the extent possible so that you end up having minimal tissue or minimal debris that get, then your chemistry and your chemicals can get in there and disinfect. Another thing is because our canal, our files are round, but most of our canals at the end of the, they are oval, you need to have some form of activation of the debris and the tissue that is in there, not the debris, but the activation of the irrigants that you're using. So for that, ultrasonics and even sonics have been proposed. Ultrasonics have a little bit of a better capacity to do that, but sonics are better than nothing. So you have a couple of different options. Alternatively, what you could use, you could use instruments that have three-dimensional shapes, you know, like this. And when they rotate along their own axis, they create a virtual type of a uh, diameter that is much larger than their core diameter. So their core diameter is thin, but once they create a spring shape and then you rotate them, just as though if you were to look at a spring from, you know, uh, along its axis, it'll end up being much wider than the diameter of the spring itself. And that's how you end up touching walls more effectively and efficiently than you would otherwise. So the school of thought that is for, uh, let's create a thing here, that is for much smaller canal anatomy, let's say if this is the thing, this is, this is the natural canal that you have, and these people are talking about having smaller, tape, smaller apical diameter, but wider taper, right? So what happens here is you'd be left with this triangle here, this area here, right? But you're removing the dentin up coronally because canals don't quite taper the same way that regular conventional um, files do. The taper of an 06 taper preparation, for example, is much wider coronally than it could be on the canal wall. If Imagine if your canal is fairly straight this way, and if you take a big taper, you're going to remove up coronally, but you're not going to remove apically where it matters most. Okay? So in order for you to have successful outcomes with these types of cases, you really have to be very good with your irrigation and disinfection because you're not literally touching these walls. So you need to somehow eliminate this tissue without touching it. This is part of the reason where the smaller the canal preparation that you have, the more you rely on your disinfectants. And that's where second you know, visit uh, or two visit endo becomes more important because what you're doing at this point is you're filling this space full of what? Calcium hydroxide. And the calcium hydroxide over the next seven to 10 days is going to help disinfect and kill and dissolve this tissue so that when you come back, now you have chemically disinfected that space and removed that sliver of tissue or biofilm. Again, people keep talking about tissue, Tissue is one bad thing, but biofilm is even the more important bad thing we need to, to think about. And biofilm ash is very, very tenacious. It doesn't go away. Like I mentioned, ideally, you need to scrape it down. But if you can scrape down that surface with the moss, you might as well be able to pour some chemical, some weed killer or something, to kill the moss and get rid of it. 
So that's how that works. And I keep losing my <laughs> items here in the background. But uh, so that, that's the idea. So that's the other schools of thought are you can create a thinner. The last school of thought is that you can create a smaller taper, but then come back at the very end and use a very large like light speed or something that is only cu cutting apically, right? And now you have the apical diameter has been cleaned and corked out like that, right? So now you have definitely removed anything that could be in here. That's kind of like the Penn school of thought and Transit school of thought. And these guys were, these guys were believing in having large apical diameters. And they were using light speed and some of these other instruments that were just cutting at the apex. So they would finish their preparation and they would throw in a few of those apically cutting uh, instruments so that they would just widen the apex. That's not a bad technique at all. That definitely would work, no question about it. But in the world that we're trying to be as minimalistic, so we don't go through a whole instrumentation at the end, have to use another three or four instruments to just do apical gauging and apical cleaning, uh, then your options are to just naturally clean to a larger diameter, size 3004, 3504, ideally. Uh, or you could go to a smaller size apical, but then a larger taper, like a 2506. And then if needed, then use a lot of irrigation and disinfection and you can clean out all those other triangles of tissue. So is that the longest answer to a short question that you could have had? <laughs> Thank you so much for such a great explanation. I've always wondered that too, just about smaller preparations, you know, inner appointment medications, but also one of the things that I've experienced myself, and I don't know if it's effective or not, is when I place calcium hydroxide, you know, I'm really, I've been thinking about spinning it backwards with a file or packing it down, you know, there's packing it down with a gutter purchase, tons of things online about it. But my question to you is, do you need to get just a 10 file with it kind of pumped up and down to the apex, or do I really need that full canal filled full of calcium hydroxide to get the, the effects that you were just talking about? Yeah. So no, actually, I think, uh, Ash, you do not need to have a packed, if you do have a packed canal with uh, calcium hydroxide, it would be obviously, it's good, it's a good idea because you'd have a reservoir that it could refill. Remember, calcium hydroxide's uh, mechanism of action is it creates a very high pH and that high pH is what's actually inhibitors to the growth of the microbes and it kills and it removes the LPS, which is the like, polysaccharides on the surface of gram-negative microbes. And that's what you want to have. You don't have to have it, you know, completely filled without a void as though you're trying to do obturation with the gas hydroxide. Um, if you could, that'd be ideal, but it's very difficult to get that. And that by trying to do that without a microscope, which allows you to really see the end of the road and how much you're injecting, you could potentially overfill the canal and can cause additional problems by extrusion of the gas hydroxide, especially if you're in an area where you could be close to the infriabular nerve or the mental nerve or any of the uh, areas that could be a problem going to the sinus. So my recommendation in these cases is if you are using a pre-mixed material that it's come such as the Ultradense or any of these other um, um, you know, companies that make the calcium hydroxide, use a very thin dispensing tip. Do not use the thickest dispensing tip you have. Part of the problem with these dispensing tips that are very conical and very tapered is that people have a tendency to put them in the canal, including the tip that comes with the BC sealer itself. It's a tapered tip. So oftentimes people take these tips and they put them into the canal and they press until it stops, virtually creating a seal, which is a lock-off effect that is horrible for anything, including your obturation, but most importantly, we're all familiar with that during your irrigation, that if you lock your needle in place, you could get an extrusion. So it's important to use a thin tip. I use the minimal waste tip, but you could use any of these small tips, including your acid etch tip or whatever, on your calcium hydroxide. And then put that in the canal, making sure it's loose. Inject the same way you would be using it for BC sealer, only in the coronal half of the root. Then what I would do is you obviously are injecting the calcium hydroxide into a canal that you've already instrumented with your rotary file. I would use the last rotary file that I used and then put, it, put the handpiece on reverse. Put the handpiece on reverse at a lower RPM. If your handpiece can get down to 100 RPM, even better, but anywhere from 300 to 100 RPM in reverse would be the ideal way that you have this cone or of, of the file going through the mass of, this, uh, of the calcium hydroxide in reverse, pushing it out. So you are, you're slowly moving the, uh, 
file through the mass of the calcium hydroxide to the working length and slowly backing off. At that point, you would theoretically have a coating of all the walls with calcium hydroxide um, because of the centripetal effect of this material just coating the walls as it's going up and down. I'm, as you know, I'm a minimalist, so you don't need to use a lentula, you don't need to use anything extra, just use whatever you have. You just use the file in the canal, the last file that you use to the apex or to the length that you went should suffice in reverse direction. If you have the endosync plus, what's nice about that is that you could put it in the uh, OTR motion. So it just goes back and forth a little bit. There's no chance of you know, over extrusion or causing problems either. So those are some of the methods that you could apply the sealer. You don't have to fill completely, but it's important to try to get the uh, calcium hydroxide to the apex or to your full preparation length. Even if you don't, don't forget, this material is liquid and the pH is permeable through the fusion laws of chemistry. The pH will kind of go uh, beyond the place that you put it. In the uh, studies that I've done, you can see that the pH actually starts to look even increase outside the root of through the dental tubules and so on and so forth. But the place in the calcium hydroxide is really important and that's, uh, I hope that is kind of a helpful tip. No, it totally is. And just the last point, because I said that was the last point before, but really, what on average is the time that you're, you know, if you are doing medicated cases, and I don't want to get into the weeds about which case, this case, that case, but if you are, how long, you know, what's the minimal, amount, minimal and maximum amount of time that you and your experience, you've been placing, having these cases wait? Generally, the recommended time frame for calcium hydroxide to work is, remember, calcium hydroxide is doing two functions. It has some tissue dissolution kind of component to it, as well as, most importantly, it's disinfection and uh, antimicrobial properties. So most of the studies are showing that about seven days is adequate when people are doing so. On the average, people are using seven to 10 days. It's important not to prolong it too long because, first of all, patients end up procrastinating. Your provisional end up uh, kind of leaking and then get recontamination, which can happen very easily. And it's also important to understand that every time you're doing a second visit, you have to use the calcium hydroxide because studies by Benz and others have shown that the microbes inside the root canal will regrow during the waiting time period. So placing an antimicrobial agent like calcium hydroxide is important if you're making things in two visits. And you should be doing things in two visits for two reasons. If you have too much microbes that you cannot uh, uh, clean out and you wanna make sure that you have a better disinfection. And number two is if you don't have enough time to do any of the procedures up to the standards that you want to achieve. Absolutely, and uh, you know that's a great, great explanation. Since he does uh, two appointment visits, and I usually do, so he says, I usually do the shaping in the first appointment, but on more than one a few occasions, I've gotten some really bad mid-treatment flare-ups. Any tips on what I'm doing wrong? Definitely, I mean, this, the, the, the subject of flare-ups is an important one because we really have to consider a couple of important things here. Let me just quickly get the back here and just draw a couple of things here for you. If you think, if just let's look at the apex of your tooth here. So what you're having here is you're having your root canal. And let's say, you know, originally what you have is you have pulp in there or microbes or bacteria. And then you have some thickening of the PDL and some inflammation here, right? Now, this inflammation, technically speaking, there should never be more post-op pain than there is pre-op pain, all right? Just think about it, because the pre-op pain is the way they present. Post-op pain is any, it could be the same as it was before, or anything beyond that is what has been added to in terms of inflammation or infection to the periapical tissue, right? So the question now is what could be causing that? Well, there's three different causes for post-op pain mechanism, right? Post-op pain is either mechanical, which means what? Which means that you take your file tip and you're playing fast and loose with your, you know, working length and all of a sudden you're past the apex and every time you're going up and down here you're jabbing this little guy here the pdl causing all kinds of pain and inflammation that's going to cause hemorrhage and that hemorrhage is going to cause pressure and that pressure is going to cause pain post-operatively right so working length is a key thing and that's why some you know uh 
things uh, that are very helpful clinically, such as a, uh, you know, a, uh, um, something like the, this endo ring here, for example, right, are so important because you need to make sure that all your measurements are absolutely accurate into the teeth. If you're off by a half, and this is a half a millimeter kind of a measurement here on this. So you can have 19 and a half millimeter versus 20 or 20 and a half millimeter. And that half a millimeter being off means that you're going to basically have pain for your patient post-op. Keep also in mind that files that are heat treated end up unwinding. And this unwinding is very much microscopic. You don't see that. So you need to constantly measure your working files. And if you have an assistant who is using a, uh, uh, was making the measurements for you. You need to make sure that you have a ring that is calibrated between the two of you. So your rulers are the same for the two of you. For your assistant and yourself, you have the same kind of a uh, ruler. Otherwise, she could be measuring, uh, you know, 21 millimeters, but you have asked for 20 millimeters, and now the difference is one millimeter. Now, the other thing that happens is when you're instrumenting long, what happens now is that you have essentially blown out the constriction. The constriction is the natural barrier that helps reduce the odds of stuff pushing out. So mechanical leads to chemical um, sort of insult. Is that it's a mechanical insult and a chemical insult? That means that what? It means you're irrigating with sodium hypochlorite, which is highly caustic and little bits of it will get out. I mean, it's a tube, right? I mean, there's some, inter, uh, there's some apical pressure, so it's gonna hold it back, but there is gonna be some, and that's why you see this more pain with cases that have lesions, because there's less apical pressure, backup pressure from that area, so your irrigation can get out more readily. And in small amounts, it's been shown that this stuff does get out, so that can cause inflammation. So it's so important, everything starts from your mechanical instrumentation and preserving your apical constriction, if you blow through it, then you can get chemical insult to the area as well as what? Biological insult. Now, what is biological insult? Remember what we talked about, the biofilm that's on the canal walls? As we're cutting with your file and going up and down, we create a ton of debris. And then this debris, every time your file is going up and down in this closed space, I mean, rather it's gonna open from two ends, but it's, in, it's literally closed from all laterally, the debris can either come up or it can get pushed down. So once you're blown through the constriction and then you keep going up and down in a piston-like effect, what you're gonna get, you're gonna get all of this microbes that were inside the canal that are mixed with debris, the so-called smear layer, is gonna get pushed out the root end. And that is going to cause a biological insult. That's why when you get patients that have an apical lesion and you've done the root canal instrumentation, you haven't been very careful with your length, you push debris out, now they're going to have a problem. You see that a lot in silver points because there's a lot of corrosion products in there as well. People go in there, remove the silver point, they go up and down, there's been a lesion that has been kind of quiet and quiescent, and all of a sudden they have pain that is intolerable and just huge because of all a combination of this chemical and biological insult that has happened by pushing this debris out the root end. So it's very important to do that. So that, that can happen at any step of the appointment. It doesn't have to be just at the uh, first appointment or at the last appointment. For your viewer who was talking about, well, I'm getting even stuff on the mid-appointment time, there's no difference between the mid-appointment and the beginning and the last. If you're not careful with your length, you can still get chemical stuff, chemical sodium hypochlorite or other stuff getting out the other root end that's gonna cause inflammation. That is inflammation that's causing the post-op pain. Um, if it's happening at the last appointment, then uh, again, that could be due to your chemical uh, disinfectants that you've done before that. Uh, pushing debris out is always the case. Now, oftentimes, Ash, you will end up seeing patients that, you know, people come in and say, well, I filled the case. Let's just get rid of all that stuff. You know, they, they you, you imagine that you have, uh, kind of filled and you get a tiny sealer puff, right? And there's a big lesion around the tooth. And then the patient has flare up and they say, well, it's 
the pain is coming from the sealer puff, right? Well, from what we just explained, first of all, it's not the puff itself that is causing, because this stuff is very, um, it's very biocompatible. What is causing the pain is the stuff that you cannot see on the x-ray, which is all the debris that has been pushed out. Because why did you get an overfill? Oftentimes, it's because you were probably, you blew out your, you know, your constriction. You uh, over-instrumented probably as well. And that means you cause chemical and biological damage to the peripheral tissue. Given that, now you're getting all of the stuff that is out that's causing inflammation, but all you see on the x-ray is this little sealer piece because that's the only thing that's really opaque. And then that's called you know, correlation causation. You see what you see and you blame it based on what you see. But what is actually causing the pain is the stuff that's invisible on the x-ray, which is all the debris of LPS, all the, all the microbial products and stuff that has been pushed out as well as the chemicals that have been pushed out that are causing the pain. Then you just have to manage it. And what do you do in these kinds of cases? If you can get IND drainage, that's usually the fastest way to address it instead of just giving patients antibiotics unnecessarily because antibiotics are, again, they have been used as a hammer for too long and they're not, it's not a good thing. The best thing in these situations is if there is a large lesion, if there is swelling, an IND would be the best approach because that's about pressure and it's about relieving of the pressure. If there is no uh, perforation of the cortical plate, trephination could be a possibility. Uh, but oftentimes, think the anti-inflammatories. If you've already adequately cleaned the tooth, take an anti-inflammatories or even steroids if needed and giving it enough time could um, help alleviate and ameliorate the situation. The main point here is just to avoid it. And the avoidance, everything starts with your ruler and your working length and how precise you are in your working length and how you care about it. I've seen people say, oh, you know what? I just removed the stopper. It prevents me from seeing what I'm doing. I just, you can't play fast and loose. You have to be very endodontics of all the, of all the professionals or rather all the specialties in, in dentistry is the most precise. I mean, you could probably say fixed process is also very precise, but uh, endo, the difference in uh, uh, you know, half a millimeter could be a lot of pain for the patient. You know, it's great really to listen to you talk about that. And I really appreciate you answering because it, it actually answered a lot of the questions that I was screaming inside to ask you um, along that discussion. And one of the things as a generalist, I think, and I've struggled with this over and over is really it's working length is such a simple concept and yet to execute it effectively. And like you said, precision can be actually quite complicated. And they were kind of going off in a little bit of a little bit of a distant, different direction here. But, you know, if you had one tip in terms of, and actually you said it already, making sure that your ruler, you're using the same ruler with your dental assistant. But, you know, my experience is that a lot of generalists don't, uh, having their dental assistant do their measuring is the next level of like, wow, I've, I've actually graduated to the next level of endodontics. Usually they either have the, the ring on their finger if they, if they have one or they're using the measurement. So what would be your next tip to just to maintain that precision? I'm not talking about when to, when to measure, you know, where to measure. I'm not doing about that, but just a simple tip to keep that precision. Probably the simplest tip I can give you, Ash, is that you need to have reproducible reference points. And that's the thing that people are not doing adequately. People are playing very fast and loose with the reference points. They're using a cusp tip, which is based on different angles that you look at it. It could be very different. It could be off by a millimeter or so. Uh, so one of the things that I do in patients that are going to get a crown after the root canals, I try to use a flat disc at the beginning and just kind of straighten out, take the tooth and flatten the cusp to the extent that I can have a flat surface. It's very important to make sure that your files, the stopper on the file is at a 90 degree angle perpendicular to the file. Many people are using like, you know, poor quality files where the stopper is gonna wobbly. And a wobbly stopper is going to be, you know, depends on if it's hanging sideways, it's gonna give you a half a millimeter or a millimeter even off based on which angle you're measuring it to. You have to be careful so that the stopper is not moving on the file as you're going up and down and you're hitting it. That's why it's important to continuously confirm, keep confirming your working length. I've seen people, even residents at times, uh, endo residents that have just kind of lost track of that and the file 
has the stopper has moved and they're now instrumenting super long, right? And the same thing again, as I said, especially with heat treated files, these files unwind ever so slightly and they get longer during instrumentation. So you need to keep adjusting for that. Having an ender ring, my ender ring is on my finger the whole time. My assistants may be measuring the file from time to time for me and putting it in the, um, the cones, but I am confirming it most of the time to make sure that they're right. Because a half a millimeter to us matters, but maybe to uh, somebody else may not be even visible. So we need to be very vigilant, working length, getting an apex locator and measuring, not to the RT, but slightly short of the RT, staying true to it, working length, reference points that are reproducible, stopper positions that are good, keep measuring the length. Those are all important, very critical points in terms of uh, achieving working length and maintaining it precisely. That is such a great tip. And I really appreciate that point about having that precision because it's absolutely critical. And, but we can talk about it, but having a little tip like that can make all the difference. And I am super guilty of everything you have talked about over and over several times because we're all located. So the last, you know, one of the questions by Regina Singh, and we talked about this earlier is really, and you are the reason why I have changed my obturation technique to see, I want to do a procedure that I can be successful at and walk away and have the patient come back in a few years and be like, yes, I did it. It was good. I don't want a procedure where it's like, oh, thank goodness I got to clean shaping. Now I've got something even more complicated to do, uh, you know, obturation. Like I, so that really was the key difference in making me be able to do endo confidently. I can focus my time on finding the canals. Actually, I can focus my time on diagnosis, making sure I can tackle the case, and then be able to clean and shape all the canals, as we just talked about. And then I don't have to worry about obturating. I really wanted to get kind of your, your tips and your tricks. There's a lot of videos online, you've got them, and I really wanted to take this time to talk to you kind of about, you've been doing this for a number of years, what are some of your solid tips and tricks about doing the BC sealer technique? So do you actually brought up a several very, very good and important points here, Ash, about the, um, uh, the determinants of your success aren't about your obturation and things like that. The first and foremost, what I always tell people is the most important part of your success comes from your diagnosis and treatment planning. Proper triage of the patient and doing cases that you're comfortable in doing properly because ultimately cases fail because people don't find the canals and they don't adequately remove the biofilm from the canals that they find. That's the reason why cases fail. If you could find all the canals and remove all the uh, biofilm from all of these uh, teeth, root canal therapy would work 99% of the time, right? And then the 1% would be just physiological reasons why people would not work. Uh, and that's the main issue. Then after that, the obturation is really, as you said, is, is the, it's kind of the icing on the cake, if you will, but it's not the, the, the it's not necessarily the most important part of the cake. Uh, you have to uh, um, have an obturation system and technique that is efficient because if I'm ending up saving a little bit of time on the obturation side, it doesn't mean for me that it means, oh my God, now my productivity is higher, I can make more money and do this and that. But it means to me that I have now saved some time that I could then spend in doing better irrigation and disinfection and finding time to find all the canals. And that's the big mistake that people make is that I, they think that when I'm talking about hydraulic condensation, uh, that I'm talking about, oh, make, let's just make, you know, quick, fast root canals and, you know, just be an economic uh, improvement to our productivity. No, it is not. It's just about allocating importance to the most important part of the root canal, which is the cleaning and disinfection. So, but obturation should be easier if possible. Historically, obturation with vertical condensation, lateral condensation, were the techniques that were needed because at the time we that's what we had we had sealers at the time that we couldn't rely on the zinc oxide eugenol sealers and resin sealers of the past had a problem they shrank they washed out and they never bonded to anything so what we needed to do we needed to use these techniques where our filler which was the gutta percha had to be either condensed laterally or had to be thermoplasticized and pushed vertically to reduce the sealer interface because we just didn't we couldn't rely on the sealer when Sealer technology improved to the point when we didn't have to reduce the sealer interface anymore to the point of like absolutely minimizing it. All of a sudden, we could think outside the box and reinvent obturation to a simpler technology and technique. And that's really the essence of the uh, 
you know, of, of this idea of, uh, of uh, hydraulic condensation, which as a concept here is, as you can see, it's the idea that you're taking a, uh, a, a canal, you're milling a shape, you're dictating a shape to it, and you take a matching coated gutta percha cone and it's coated with particles that can actually bond to the, uh, uh, to the sealer, and the sealer can bond to the canal wall, so it's pre-silinated, if you will. So these are the gutta percha cones that are coated, and then you put the sealer in the canal, and then what you're doing is you are then seating that cone into place. It's a cone that is seated. Then all you need to do at this point is instead of burning it all the way down to the five millimeter from the apex, condensing it to minimize the sealer interface and then backfilling it with gutta percha, you're basically achieving all of that in one step. You're relying on your cement to create your uh, seal. And that is basically what we've been doing in post cementation all of this time. That has been the concept of what we've been doing. Of course, many people have been kind of attacking the technique as a single cone, which is kind of calling it single cone because they're trying to associate the technique with the old single cone technique back in the 50s that failed, which included an O2 taper gutta percha cone and a C of zinc oxide usual sealer, which predictably the sealer washed out and uh, shrank and it caused problems down the line. Hydraulic condensation is different. It's about a matched cone to a canal wall where the sealer itself is uh, creating the seal, not the gutta percha cone. Uh, so that's the key part. And uh, is it just a single cone? Well, if you have a small canal, Ash, as you would know, by the time you're creating, finishing up your shape, you only have room for one mashed cone. There's just no more enough room. But if you have a wide distal canal on a root or a wide parallel root, there is going to be, you know, apically you, may, you maybe have a fit, but then coronally you're going to have too much of a flare. And then there might be room on the side. In those cases, by all means, add additional cones because you're going to be able to then uh, fill up that space with additional cones and uh, uh, you have a better looking case and it's gonna be less voids in there possibly. But you don't need to be thermoplasticizing this, nor do you have to really push it too hard uh, clinically with, 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 with a spreader because ultimately what you're doing is you are getting your um, uh, fill from, uh, you're getting your seal from the, your sealer and you've got a percha cone is acting merely as a condenser as a uh, path kind of creator for if you ever need to have a revision. And uh, it also gives you a length control that way as well. So it's got three main functions. That's great. Thank you. You know, it, and that's such a great description. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a link up for, you've got uh, probably a thousand videos of the, <laughs> the uh, BC sealer technique that you have created yourself. And like I was talking about before, you've really changed the global kind of my perception about how this this approach like you said really makes it makes successful endodontics more achievable by those that want to achieve it that can do it and like you said spend more time doing the things that are important and focus less on pulling that cone out and then just lose pulling your hair out of your head when you're doing the obturation technique so thank you so much for for describing that let me just say one more thing too about the obturation techniques that are been present, lateral condensation, vertical condensation, and hydraulic condensation, they're all good techniques. I'm not saying this is the only way to do things. I'm trying to say that, that if you do everything right, you could, if you prefer to do vertical, you're fine. If you want to prefer to do lateral, you're fine. This technique allows you to be more efficient in your obturation. And the main point of understanding here is that vertical and lateral condensation techniques try to solve a problem that no longer exists. That is the problem of sealer uh, washout and shrinkage and things like that, that was uh, previously a hallmark of uh, zinc oxide regional sealers and resin sealers. So that's what I was talking about, about the simplicity is, you know, that we need to, to introduce so that we can gain time and go on about more important things. Uh, Ali, Dr. Nassay, it's been an absolute honor listening to you speak and review some of the questions that my viewers have had. It's, uh, I've been following you for the last decade uh, online and you're the, the, your your passion for sharing minimalist and practical and actually predictable techniques is absolutely incredible. So thank you so much for spending the time with me and sharing your experience and your your teaching your teaching uh, techniques are absolutely incredible. So thank you so much. 
Ash, uh, it's very kind of you to, 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 to be so nice. It's, it's always a pleasure to, to just talk about endo uh, with you and people like you who are so passionate about endodontics and dentistry as a whole and who are interested in teaching. So I'd be happy to do this anytime. And uh, to your viewers, I uh, want to say those of you guys who are doing endo, remember endo is very predictable, has a very high success rate if you follow the basic principles. It's not about any of these specific technologies and techniques and branded commercial materials. The principles of endodontic therapy have not changed over the past century, if you will. The principles are still the same. It's all about finding all the canals, removing all the, uh, of the bacteria and the tissues inside the tooth to the end of the road. And in the process, making sure that you're not destroying the tooth and uh, completely disinfecting it and leaving the patient with something that's restorable and predictable in the long run. At the end of the day, it's all about delaying tooth loss, as it's been always said. Um, all medicine is about essentially uh, maintaining health for as long as possible. The same thing here with endodontic therapy. So thank you again, Ash, for having me. It was a pleasure and look forward to doing this again in the future. Awesome.